Okay, welcome back to CE 528. And I wanna pick up our thread from the example that we were discussing at the end of the lecture last week. And And I showed you this very extreme example where there are two alternatives that differ vastly between their initial cost and their total benefits. So, and if you compare the two in terms of net present worth, it's very clear that alternative A is high, has higher net present worth. But if you look at the simple benefit cost ratio approach, the alternative B has clear ad advantage. And it's also clear to me like which one I'm picking because typically because there are risks involved in estimating all the costs and benefits. So you might as well start with just spending $2,000 rather than $2 million. So I can see that why I would pick alternative B, but you can see how the measures can lead you astray in terms of if you were to just look at net present worth. So this, is, this type of extreme example you would not find in the real life in terms of the contrast that these two alternatives have. However, it does illustrate that these measures, net present worth and benefit cost ratios, they both have their biases. So for example, net present worth will tend to favor the larger projects versus benefit cost ratio, which will tend to benefit the smaller projects, a smaller cost project at the beginning. And, and that's a problem because we don't want that. We want a little bit more unbiased. So sometimes it's beneficial to have looked at some other measures. And what are some of the other measures we look at? And, and those measures include what we call the internal rate of return, IRR. Now, all the problems that you might have solved in CE321 and 321 or 322 rather. So all the problems where you measure the, the alternatives, you, would, you were in fact given maybe a series of costs and you were also given series of benefits. And then you were given those two values. What else would be given to you in the problem? Any thoughts on, you will be given some values of costs and benefits over time, maybe the initial cost, the annual benefit, annual cost, maybe some, some closeout cost, or maybe some salvage value. What else is usually you are given in this type of problem? Can you type it up in chat and let me know? Other than cash flows at different periods of time, at different points in time, what else are you usually given in a problem like this? so that you can estimate the discounted cost and discount benefits. Can you type that up in chat for me? You would be given what else? The costs over time, cash flow of costs, cash flow of benefits, but what else? Yes, see some chat message there. Like how many years or months? Yes, you will be given the timeline that you know the project has a 10 year life, life, life cycle. That's a good point. What else? What else would you be given? So each project would have a 10 year life cycle, 15 year, five year, whatever. Each project alternative would have that. What else would you be given in the problem? So let's go back to the formula that you need. So if you are trying to look at this formula on, on the sheet here, so let's say if you're given this formula, present value is equal to annual value, and you wanna apply this formula, you need the number of years, you need the cash flows, maybe annual values, but if you wanna find the present value, I think now I'm seeing more messages, the interest rate, and the compounding period, that's exactly right. You will need the interest rate, right? Now, obviously you'll need the interest rate. And if you do need the interest rate, this is where IRR becomes very interesting. When you're trying to calculate IRR, you don't use that interest rate. 
instead you come up with a bunch of different discount rates like 0%, 2%, 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%. 10 and then you calculate the net present value of that project. Right? And then once you do that, you figure out what is the net present value at different interest rates. So you will see, for example, this project. Let's actually try to get our pens and papers out. And I want to, I want you to make sure, I want to make sure that you guys can all work this example in um, by yourselves. So let's let's see if you can if you can do that real quick. So what I want you to do is estimate the net present value of costs and benefits for this particular alternative. So I'm only showing you one alternative right here. And the initial cost of that alternative is like $10,000. Or, and, and the benefits of that, that alternative is 3,000 at the end of year one, 3,000 at the end of year two, I'm sorry, it's 3,000 at the end of year two, $3,000 each year. So now you're trying to figure out what is the internal rate of return for this project. And to be able to do that, we need to assume a series of discount rates and estimate the net present worth of this alternative. So I can do the 0%. That's pretty easy for me. So I'm going to show you how to do a, how did I do the 0%? That's pretty easy because in 0% interest rate, if the discount rate is assumed to be 0%, all these future values of money, basically what you're saying is that you cannot earn any interest on your money because the money is has discounted at a 0% rate. So all these future money will have the same value as today's dollars, right? Does that make sense? So if you were to do that, the net present value would be, the cost of the net cost will be 10,000 and the benefits will be 12,000 because they are all in the same period because the interest rate is 0%, so I'm good to go. But what happens if the interest rate is 2%? What I want you to do is, I want you to verify what is the present value of a series of $3,000 over four year period, what's the net present worth, net present value of the benefits of $3,000 total cost or, or annual benefit and an interest rate of 2%. So I is equal to 2% and N is equal to four years. Let's, let's try to figure that out. The five years rather, because you, you're getting those. So if you have four equal benefits, so what you'll do is you're going to apply this formula right here. So I want you to go ahead and apply that. So if I go back to that formula, so I'm going to try to see if I can. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to make sure that we are copying this formula right here. Oops. Go ahead and draw. So this is the formula you're applying. Okay. So the present value is equal to annual value one plus I raised to power N minus one over I raised to power one plus I raised to power N. So I want you to write down this formula on your notebooks or you can Google search it. I mean, either way is fine. But I want you to find the present value using this formula, make a note of that. And oops. Okay. 
I mean, apply that formula and see if you can figure out at I equal to 2%, what happens to this formula. And your annual value obviously is 3000. So if A is 3000 in that formula, your interest rate is 2%. So one plus 0 0.02 raised to power N minus one over 0 0.02 times 1.02 raised to power four. So if you apply that formula, Let's see what happens. You get the net present va net present value of benefits to be eleven thousand one ninety nine. Obviously, the value goes down, right? I hope all of you can see that because now your money can earn interest. So the future three thousand dollars are not worth as much money as they used to be when the interest rates were zero percent. So again, I'm I'm asking you to calculate this and verify based on the formula that I showed you before, I want you to verify this calculation right here, especially the second one, the 11,199 calculation. Actually, I got the calculator myself, so I want you to do the same thing, see if you can verify it. Take a minute to verify it. Any questions, any comments? You can also use, if you're looking for other ways of computing that, you could also do, you can also basically do, if you're doing it in an Excel sheet, for example, if you're not trying to use one formula, you can also use, you can also convert, oops, I'm sorry. You can also convert this $3,000, this $3,000, this $3,000, this $3,000 into the same unit of time as the $10,000 and then use that in, and add them up and obviously and then you could you could you could derive it based off of that and if you want me to show you the formula i could write down that formula here as well so the p equal to if that will help you guys p equal to a times 1 plus i raised to power n minus 1 divided by I times one plus I raised to power N. So this is in parentheses, one plus I raised to power N. Sorry for the terrible handwriting there. But I hope all of you can see that. Is anybody able to verify this? Give another maybe 30 seconds or so to see if you can.
Yeah, actually, this, this is interesting because I got the same thing as well. So maybe there is an error on this slide. So basically, I, I noticed that I'm what I'm getting is I, I just calculated it and I got the same number. 11,423 and I, I got the same number. And I think there is probably an error on this slide. So So I, I got slightly different number as well, 11,423. So I, I will check and verify this for you guys if, if I'm getting the same thing. But the idea is that you know you, you use that number and I'll check that, check that one more time and I'll confirm with you guys if there is an error here. But you basically need to apply this type of a formula to convert that into present value. And then when you subtract the benefit minus the cost, you get the, you get the net present worth of that alternative. Anybody got the actual 11199 number? Hmm. If not, then yeah, let me let me check, check those numbers once again, and I'll, I'll make sure that we, we verify these, these numbers. But, but let's kind of go with this right now, because we do know that the net present value of benefits will decrease as the interest rate rise, right? Because you're, Money today is worth more and more compared to the future monies if your interest rate rises. So when the interest rate becomes 4%, the value becomes 10,471. When the interest rate becomes 6%, the value becomes 9,807 and so on and so forth. But then what you do is in the last column, we are subtracting B minus C, benefit minus the cost, because the cost is only at the beginning of time then essentially you're, you're dealing with the same issue. You're, you're dealing with 10,000 and your benefit values are changing as the interest rate changes and you can plot that value over time. And the IRR, the internal rate of return is defined as the interest rate where the net present worth becomes zero. the net present worth becomes zero. That's what we call the internal rate of return, IRR value. Okay? So you could see between somewhere between four and 6%, the value goes from 470 to negative 193. And then we want to find out where this, and there are numerical methods to do this, but the IRR, the conceptual definition of IRR is where the net present worth, this point right here, where the net present worth becomes zero. And we'll figure out what the calculation looks like, but is the concept of IRR clear to you guys when the net present worth becomes zero? Now, typically it's not a good idea again to kind of compare your projects just based on IRR. I have a question at the end of this slide right here. Does the alternative with the highest IRR value typically win? Not really. You know, we, what, what typically happens is that when you are making these calculations, what you try to do is you try to have a threshold on IRR. And then you say, I want to have an, at least an IRR of 5%. And if there is an alternative that does not give you that IRR, you just say, okay, I'm not going to actually consider the alternatives that are below that. So IRR, the internal rate of return, is not used as much as like, you know, like benefit cost ratios are like, okay, I'm gonna pick the one with the highest benefit cost ratio. Instead, the IRR one is typically used as if, you know, and the, the typically the way you use IRR is that you, you define a threshold on the IRR at the beginning of the analysis and you say, okay, I'm gonna not consider any project that doesn't give me at least 5%. And then you make sure that all the alternatives that you consider are above 5%. And it could be 8%, it could be 10%, whatever. But you just, all you do is you define a threshold for IRR and you don't consider any project below that IRR for considerations. You eliminate anything that has 
that has lower than that internal rate of return threshold, you ignore that alternative. So it's more as a threshold based value rather than an alternative, um, you know, direct comparison of alternative type measure. Any question about this? And I know we will take care of that snafu on the, on the calculation here. But is concept of IRR somewhat clear to you guys? And any, and if you have any thoughts on, on how they might have calculated 11,199, and I will check that as well. I did take an example from, from somewhere. So I'll, I'll take a look at that and see what's going on. And I will try to explain. But if you have any ideas about that, I'm, I'm all ears. So let me know, please. Any questions about IRR at all? Remember IRR is this value right here where your graph hits the 0% interest rate. You're plotting the interest rate versus the net present worth. So you're plotting this last column with this first column, and then you're looking for where it hits the 0%. And there are numerical methods to find it precisely. But oftentimes we are only interested in whether our alternatives meet a certain rate of return or not. Not seeing any questions, so I'll move on. And then let's look at the idea of the payback P. Okay? So there is another one that we talked about, another measure that we talked about before that is called the payback period. And what is a payback period? Payback period means at what point your benefits, at what point your benefits basically outrun your cost, when your benefits exceed the cost. And the project where it happens the soonest, that is typically considered the best project based on the payback period. Okay, so in this case, if you just kind of went by the payback period, Project C will win because it has no benefits in year four, five, and six, but because it has higher benefits at $1,000 at the very beginning. So in this, in, in this example, if you use payback period as your measure of performance, you'll always find that projects that have benefits front-loaded will tend to win out. Right. For example, alternative C here has very front loaded benefits because its benefits are all in between year one and three. And it has no benefits starting from year four, five, and six. But if you do any other calculation, if you do benefit cost ratio, net present worth, whatever, at most discount rates, you will tend to prefer alternative D. Even at 0% interest rate, you'll prefer alternative D because it just has more numerical benefits. But if you just went by payback period, what you will see is that the alternative C would win, right? And this is again to demonstrate that all these new measures that we are learning about the internal rate of return, payback period, benefit cost ratio and net present worth that we already knew about, all these measures, they are not free of their bias. They have their own biases in place, right? So we just have to know all these measures, how to calculate these measures, and then just learn how to use them. And then as long as we are aware of their biases, we can make an intelligent decision about which alternatives to pick based on all of those measures and not just get tied down to just one measure. So payback period is defined as the period 
when your benefits exceed your cost. The project for which it happens the soonest, that's the preferred alternative if you pick pay payback period as your measure of performance. Questions about payback period? Are there any questions about payback period? Okay, no questions, I'm gonna move on. So here are some, a summary of all the problems that you might see. And some of these we have already seen. Net present worth, it has a bias towards large projects regardless of the relative payoff. Simple benefit cost ratio is blind to the magnitude of benefits. So tends to favor small projects. Same thing with IRR. If you will notice that if you just go by IRR, internal rate of return, internal rate of return is the highest when you invest the fewest amount of money at the beginning. Because your rate of return, internal rate of return goes down if you invest more money at the front end. That they bring tends to bring down your IRR. So that's why simple benefit cost ratio and simple IRR they are sort of blind to the magnitude of the product benefits. And then payback period obviously is blind to the implications of different economic lifetime as we saw in the previous slide, where a project that had no benefits in year four, five, and six would be preferred if you just looked at the payback period. Okay, so these biases are very important for you to, to kind of take, take care of. You don't have to blindly remember them, but you can almost see that, right? Benefit cost ratio and net present worth. We saw that with a very stark example. And then internal rate of return obviously comes down if your initial investment is very high. So that's why simple IRR tends to favor the smallest projects as well, where you put in least amount of money at the beginning. So even the smallest benefits then appear to be, to be large in terms of IRR. And then payback period obviously is blind to the implications of different lifetime. Make sense? Questions? So here are, so because we know that these, all these measures have certain biases, we can also almost guess who prefers these things, who prefers which measures. If you are a business, Generally, businesses prefer IRR and payback period because they want, to, they want to invest as less money as possible and get most for their bank for their bucks, right? So, so IRR and payback period, so they want to choose alternatives that have least amount of investment, early investment, or where they can recoup their money the fastest, right? So IRR and payback period typically are preferred by the businesses. Government agencies prefer benefit cost ratios. So again, if they can get away with uh, spending least amount of money, then they, they, they want that. And then cost effectiveness, the same thing, least amount of money, most life save. And then if you are a theoretician, you prefer the net present worth because that's basically appropriately account for everything. But what it's not accounting for is sometimes maybe the risk that maybe some of your estimates might be wrong and theoreticians obviously believe that all the estimates are correct. So then that way you wanna maximize the net present worth. But if you take a look at that very stark example that I gave you at the end of the last lecture, where you had 2 million investment versus 2000 investment, nobody except for the theoretician would go for a $2 million investment because everybody understands that, you know, maybe your estimates are a little bit off so you probably don't want to estimate or don't want to spend $2 million when you can work with $2,000 alternative. Okay. So it's probably best to look at all the indicators and try to get the entire story and then maybe apply your judgment based on all the measures and then figure this out. Okay. 
Now I want to stop here for a second and I want to give you a chance to maybe if you can take a look at the PDF notes that I've submitted uh, that are provided online, make sure that you understand everything, give you a two minute gap here and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, so I, I just want to give everybody a two minute chance to, to kind of take it all in before I get into the next topic, which is the, which is the incremental analysis. It's a little bit advanced topic than what we have covered so far, but I just want to give everybody a chance to collect uh, their thoughts. So I'm going to pause the recording for a couple of minutes here. Okay, so resume the recording. I'm going to do an incremental analysis now. So in the incremental analysis, what we do is we take what we call a sort of a defender challenger approach. We take what we call a defender challenger approach. So we, what we do is we first pick the alternative with the smallest net present value of cost. Okay, so just the smallest net present value of cost. So we pick that alternative. And then we do a normal benefit cost comparison. So B, we do benefit of that alternative divided by the cost of that alternative. So if you look at so if you look at any alternative that's given, so you just pick the one with the smallest cost. If the benefit of benefit divided by cost for that project or that alternative is less than one, then you say, okay, this is not going to work for us. And I'm going to pick with the next smallest value of cost. Okay. Return to step one to pick from the alternative remaining. Otherwise, K becomes the first. So, but if the B by C is more than one, then it becomes the first defender. So it sort of is the champion right now. And then the next person or next project group has to beat that defender or that champion. Okay. And how could it beat it? It could beat it if the next alternative with the next smallest cost, call it the challenger J. And what you do is you do BJ minus BK. So benefit, benefit of the Jth project or the second project that you're the challenger minus the benefit of the first one, the defender divided by CJ minus CK, the cost of the J minus the cost of project K, okay? So basically you, you, you see what we are doing here? We are saying, if you spend that much extra money, CJ minus CK, how much extra benefit are you getting? If that comes out to be less than one, then you reject J. You say, okay, no, J actually did not beat my alternative K, my defender. So I'm going to stick with K as my champion right now. Okay. And I'm going to take the next one that has the next smallest net present value of cost. Okay. Now this procedure, and you keep going with this procedure until you hit the very end. And what I want you to do is next is, I want to do, this is the best way to learn is, is through an example. And let's do that. Let's write down these numbers on a sheet. Okay, so make sure that you have a sheet of paper in front of you and you can write these write these numbers down so let me see if i can have a little whiteboard where i can <clears throat> where i can copy these um, so here is my problem where I want to apply the incremental benefit cost ratio analysis. I only have two alternatives here. That's okay. But I want to still demonstrate that incremental procedure. In terms of obviously the simple benefit cost ratio, if you just look at the, so net present value of benefits, net present value of costs is 190. 
respectively for alternative A and then for alternative B, it's 1,980. And you can apply the simple benefit cost ratio and you will learn that alternative A has of 1.11, alternative B, B has a benefit cost ratio of 1.02. But I want to do what we call the incremental analysis. Incremental analysis, the idea is that See, to go from alternative A to alternative B, you are spending 900 extra dollars. Are you getting commensurate benefits from that? Are you getting benefits that are commensurate with the cost or not if you spend that 900 extra dollars that you're spending if you go with alternative B? That's the idea. So let's do the incremental analysis here. So first of all, who is going to be your defender? Please type in the chat, who is going to be your defender in this case? What is the criteria that we use to identify the first champion, the defender? I see that in the chat. Alternative C will be the defender. I mean, what's C? Alternative A, right? Yeah, alternative A would be the defender, that's right. Right, because it has the least cost. So I wanna start with the least cost. Because I'm, my goal is to see what happens. Am I getting commensurate benefits if I spend more money, right? That's exactly what I'm trying to see. So I start with alternative A, which has, which has the least amount of initial present value of cost, right? It's only, so I'm sorry. If I go from nine, spending $90 to spending $1,000. So I, I'm sorry, I was referring to benefits as cost before. But still, the answer is the same. Alternative A is what I'll pick. And what is my challenger? Obviously, alternative A, I'll first check if A has a benefit cost ratio of more than one, which it does. If you divide the cost being 90, the benefits being 100. If you do benefit divided by cost, 100 divided by 90. So... <clears throat> If I do 100 divided by 90, my benefit cost ratio, simple one for us, 1.11. It's greater than one. It's greater than 1.0, which is great. So I'll keep that as my defender. And then I'm going to pick the alternative B. And then I'll calculate my incremental benefit cost ratio. And the formula for that is BJ minus BK over CJ minus CK. Right? So let's just do that. What's my alter alternative J? Alternative J is project B. And I, what's the benefit of alternative B? It's 1000 minus BK, which is 100 divided by CJ minus CK, CJ cost is 980 minus 90, okay? So essentially the calculation you're making is 1000 minus 100 divided by CJ 980 minus 90. You all see that? And what does that give you in terms of the IRR. So I'm going to just take it, take my calculator and do it. And, and why I do it in the class is because I want to make sure that you have your calculators on and, and you could do it as well. So, so, so hopefully you guys are doing that. So I got a number called 1.011. So I basically, when I, Estimated that value, I got a number 1.01. .01. What does that tell me? Yep, 1.011 .01 is exactly what I got as well. I saw that number in chat as chat as well. So if you go back to your notes, what you will find is Okay. 
if that number came out to be less than one, you reject the, the king, the new, the new challenger, you reject the challenger J. But in, the, in our case, that came out to be more than one. So do we reject alternative B as a new defender? Or do we stick with alternative A as our defender? What do you think? We got an incremental benefit cost ratio of 1.011. What does that tell you? You wanna, you wanna crown alternative B the new champion or you wanna stick with A now? Yes, we have a new defender is exactly right. B is the new champion because we're getting our money's worth for the extra dollars that we're spending. This is great. So I, I guess you all understand this now. B is the new champion, and this is how we do it. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and share my slides again. So this is basically all the steps that we were following. And we were able to follow those steps because alternative B is, in fact, a successful challenger because my incremental ratio came out to be more than 1.0 questions about this. And again, if we had alternative C, for example, we'll now match B with C. We'll keep going until we have exhausted all the alternative. And you will do that in the lab. So you'll have opportunities to, to learn that process. Any questions? <clears throat> I want to talk about a little bit more about the ambiguity count calculation. So I, when you do IRR, sometimes there is an issue, what we call the ambiguity in IRR calculation. Now you have to remember the definition of IRR. Remember in IRR calculations, I don't assume an interest rate. I'm not given or I'm not using a given discount rate, right? Remember that? I don't typically use a given discount rate when I'm using, when I'm applying the IRR calculation. IRR is all about, if you recall our slide, this slide right here, if you recall from this slide, it's about assuming different interest rates and then estimating benefit minus the cost at those different interest rates. Right? So you don't, so in all the other calculations, the incremental benefit cost ratio, everything like that, we will be given an interest rate and we'll always work with that. IRR calculations are different because we have to figure out at what interest, we have to actually figure out the interest rate at which the net present worth becomes zero. Okay. So that's why IRR presents a special challenge what we call the ambiguity in the IRR calculation. And that ambiguity comes up only in the projects. It won't show up everywhere, even though the process will be the, always the same. However, the ambiguity comes up in projects that have high initial cost cash flow, very high initial cost. But at, and then series of annual net benefits. So this is the cost I'm showing. So what I'm showing below the axis is the cost and above the axis is the benefit. So when I do that, and then I have at the end also a very large cost. And this is the cost that we call a closeout cost. And this could be like, you know, let's say your project ends in 10 years. And after 10 years, whoever did that project has to clean out the impacts of that project, right? So maybe, you know, maybe it's a new rail line for some construction purposes that you have to now dismantle. There might be some salvage value at the end, but actually some projects also, in, also involve what we call the closeout cost. And those are the types of projects where we run into ambiguity in IRR calculation. Okay. So what are those ambiguity? How do they arise? Let's think about those a little bit. So if you were to take a project like this, 
And you will have one like that in your lab assignment tomorrow that I'm going to assign. You will have a project exactly like this. And if you did the calculation that I suggested that you do, when I was showing you that IRR slide that you assume different interest rate, 0%, 2%, 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%, 10%, 10%, and you try to draw what your net present value looks, net present worth of that project looks like, NPW looks like on the y-axis, and then you measure that at the discount rate, the graph will look something like this. It won't look the kind that we saw it won't look the kind that we saw here. It won't look something like this. No, nope. it doesn't look like this at all. Because if it looked like this, then we would have found that IRR to be to here, right? This would have been our IRR, this value right here, where it intersects, where that line intersects zero. But in fact, our graph does not look like this. Our graph looks like what I'm showing you here. It has what we call two IRRs, IRR one and IRR two, because the net present worth graph becomes zero at two places. Okay. At the beginning, of, at the low value of interest rates, and also at the very high value of interest rates. Why does that happen? You run into ambiguity because here is the deal. Remember the cash flow diagram I showed you in the last slide? Let's go back to the cash flow diagram I showed you. Oops. See, what this cash flow diagram is telling you is that because you have a very high initial cost, right? You want the interest, interest rate to be low to minimize the impact of this initial high cost. Because if the interest rates are low, then all this initial high cost you're able to invest and not lose a lot of money because you wouldn't have earned a lot of interest on it anyway. However, at low interest rate, at low interest rate, the big closeout cost at the end that you have, that has an outside impact at the beginning of the, at the project's net present worth. So this is what happened. This is what's going on here is that from the perspective of the low closeout cost. So at low interest rate, at the beginning of the chart, at the low interest rate, your closeout cost basically pulls down your net present word in the negative territory. And at the very high interest rate, your very high initial investment pulls down the net present worth in the negative territory. So that's what I say. The initial cost dominates at the high discount rate because that has a very outside impact on what, what it's gonna have, what's gonna happen to your net present worth. Because remember, at high interest rate, you are less likely to make big investment at the beginning. But the alternative involves big investment. That means that your big interest rate, your large interest rate, pulls down your net present worth because of that high initial cost. And that's what I mean when I say initial cost dominates, that means at high discount rates, my initial rates have an outsized impact and they bring down my net present worth into the negative territory. On the other hand, at low interest rates, because remember on the left side of the axis, my discount rate is lower side. At low interest rate, an expense that I'm gonna have at the very end, has an outsized impact. That is actually gonna impact me negatively, right? So that brings down my cost. If, if a project only had one or the other, then there would be no ambiguity. You will know that a project with high closeout cost and a low initial cost will have high IRR. And you will be fine with that because there will be only one zero and the diagram would look 
something like this. that we saw in the previous uh, chart. But in projects that have both high initial cost and high closeout cost, you will run into this double zeros, so to speak. You'll have hit two, two zeros at the same time. In the same project alternative, you'll hit the zero twice. What does that actually mean then? Which one should you pick? If you're getting two answers for IRR, internal rate of return, which alternative do you pick? Any thoughts on that? If you're getting two answers for IRR, which alternative do you pick? Or which are not which alternative, I'm sorry. Which IRR do you pick? IRR1 is the correct answer or IRR2 the correct answer? And remember, we are going to do in tomorrow's lab, you're going to do an example just like that, where you're going to have that ambiguity in the mix. So I, I, I noticed a response in the chat that said IRR1, presumably because it's lower, and you say, okay, I want to, I want to be conservative side, so I want to do that. Not, not quite actually, not quite. We don't want to because remember, you're thinking you're being conservative. Both neither is probably closer to the right answer, so that's what it means to be having ambiguity, right? Now, if you were in person in the class, I hopefully you see some smiling faces, but when this is an online class, this is virtual. So that's okay. I'll, I'm assuming you're smiling. Um, so, so the question, the response I got is that both or neither. Actually, that's the right response because that's what ambiguity really means, right? Because you really don't know which one to pick. And that's a problem. Yeah, you don't really know which one to pick here. So wh how you, what do you do? What you do is, you try to eliminate the ambiguity somehow. We don't like this double. We don't like this double intersection of the x-axis. We don't like that at all. We want only one of those. So the answer is neither really. IRR1 or RR2 are not the right answers. So anytime you see a project's alternative which has high initial cost and high closeout cost, here is what you do. You somehow eliminate this closeout cost dominance. You somehow eliminate that closeout cost dominance. You want to get rid of it somehow. And how do you get rid of it? If you can somehow get rid of this closeout cost at the end, that's, that's basically messing up at the low interest rates is bringing down and at very high interest rate is bringing the NPW up, net present worth to be higher. If you can somehow get rid of that closeout cost, then you will be in good shape, then you will be in business. How do you do that? So, so what we call that process is resolution of IRR, uh, resolution of the IRR or IRR ambiguity. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to resolve the ambiguity in IRR. And how do we resolve it? Here is how we resolve it. In practice, one must eliminate the part of the decision which is least important. And what's least important is the closeout cost you don't really necessarily want to have the closeout cost at a varying interest rate. So you eliminate that part of the decision and you assume a borrowing interest rate and use that rate to take your closeout cost and estimate that into an equal and uniform annual payment based on one given interest rate. Right? So let's say you have a closeout cost at the end 
you distribute that close out cost into a uniform annual amount every year based on a fixed assumed interest rate now you're thinking okay how do i assume interest rate you know that's what we've been doing every for every alternative for every other measure for benefit cost ratio we've been doing that for net present worth we've been doing that you know when we were trying to calculate different alternatives net present worth and benefit cost ratio we had a given interest rate so what you should do is pick that interest rate just one of the one pick that interest rate that is given to you in the problem to estimate all the other measures use that interest rate to distribute out the close out cost over time and then basically eliminate that from your consideration and then just basically do the irr calculations once again at varying interest rate do the whole thing one more time so this is what you are supposed to do okay so the original problem had both original problem had let me <clears throat> Light. Original problem had this thing and this thing, right? It had both the initial cost and the closeout cost. Both. You do this. You take just the closeout cost. You do this. You transform that into uniform annual payment, and you do this step. You do this step. at an assumed interest rate okay so you do this step at an assumed interest rate you take the close out cost and distribute that equal annual payment okay and then equal amount payment obviously these are costs so they will be a cash flow diagram at the lower like below the axis and then you calculate the net value you calculate the net value these were your benefits and then you reduce the benefit by this amount so your net cash flow gets goes down but then now your cash flow diagram looks much better because once you assume once you have done that at assumed interest rate your cash flow diagram now doesn't have that ugly close out cost at the end right and now your cash flow looks looks like usual thing not a very large close out cost at the end but a c a present value and a series of annual benefits that are maybe different every year from every year and that's okay but but that's what you end up with remember you did the middle part of the calculation you did this part right here remember you assume you, you did this part right here the middle portion of this problem at an assumed interest rate that's very important that assumed given fixed interest rate here you're not applying the irr stuff not doing it at varying interest rate you just pick an interest rate and you do it once you do it you modify your cash flow diagram and if you use a modified cash flow diagram now to do your irr calculation as i recommended at varying interest rate you figure out where the npw goes to zero now you would have resolved the ambiguity now you won't have that problem that you were running into before because there is no ugly cost at the end anymore you don't have that anymore is that process sort of make sense any questions you can type it up in the chat or you can mute your unmute yourself and let me know give you 30 seconds or so no questions at all now remember this this one of your alternatives is going to have that 
one of your alternatives in the lab tomorrow is going to have that exact issue. So hopefully you've figured out how to do this. Obviously, if you haven't figured it out, I'll help you do it in the lab also. I got something in the chat finally, so this is great. Yes, so the uniform annual payments will be of the same height below the axis, yes. When you transform the uniform annual payments, they will be of the same height. And I think you'll be able to see that if I clear all drawing, you'll be able to see that, that, that yes, these are all of the same height. But because the benefits of different value at the beginning, then when you do the net of that, they're also of different height. So basically you're subtracting that uniform amount from the actual cash flow that you were getting every year. And then you're getting a positive cash flow still, hopefully every year, but then this is what it looks like. Okay. Question that I've been asked, what annual interest rate you use? I did say, when you go from this step to this step, I did write down very clearly. Assumed. Okay, at an assumed interest rate, you do that. And what, what interest rate to assume? You can assume the same interest rate that you've been using to calculate all the other measures like the benefit cost ratio and net present worth and payback period and whatnot. Okay, so just use that interest rate, the discount rate problem that's given to you in the problem. So you just use that. In IRR, we typically don't use that, but if you see an ambiguity, you will have to and take that closeout cost and distribute that at fixed rate. And then once you do that, now, once you arrive at this cost flow diagram, once you're here at this diagram, do variable to figure out where NPW goes to zero. Once you're here at this modified cash flow diagram, then you can simply, you can simply do the IRR process that I talked about. You can do variable interest rate to figure out where the NPW net present worth goes to zero. Does that answer your question? Okay, and again, I'll make the video recording of this lecture available as well, so you can always refer back to it also. Okay, see another question here. Perfect, just more of a comment. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the annotation. <clears throat> okay, so some common perception of the discount rate You know, so I want to, I want you to think about which one of you, which one of these, and let's count them like from like the first bullet point could be one and then two and then three and then four and five. So inflation rate is number four, opportunity cost is number five, the riskiness of investment is number three, cost of borrowing money is number one, and estimate of willingness to bear the risk is number two. Which one is the most appropriate definition for when you're evaluating different transportation projects? Which one do you think is the most appropriate definition? Yeah. If you consider First one to be number one, cost of borrowing money to be number one, and then opportunity cost of capital to be number five. One through five, which one is the most appropriate definition or most appropriately describes when you're evaluating the definition of I 
interest rate or the discount rate when you're evaluating different alternatives. Okay, I see some. I see number five and number three. I think number five is the right answer here. It's the opportunity cost of capital. What else could you have done with that money? So we think of discount rate as a, if you didn't put the money on this project, how much more money you could have earned on that? How much interest you could have earned on that money? So it's so the best way to think about what we are doing in all of these calculations is in fact, the opportunity cost of capital. And I kind of have these. So the worst of these is sort of the inflation rate. Okay. Cost of borrowing money, it's true, but if you're doing more financial analysis, not an engineering economics analysis. Um, so this is basically when you're deciding on different investments from, from you know, when you're trying to do some financial instruments and you're trying to pick out which one. So cost of borrowing money could be, could be one. Uh, so the first three are not as wrong. They're somewhat incorrect, but not as wrong. Inflation rate is obviously the most incorrect. It is not inflation because discount rate is supposed to be the opportunity cost of capital accounting for inflation already. So it's definitely not the inflation rate. Okay. So the rest, the first three are somewhat wrong, but they could be correct in different contexts of financial analysis. But in our context, the most appropriate definition is this is the opportunity cost of capital. All right, so that's good. So, so just remember that it's the money that you could have earned on that initial investment. That's what you, that you're foregoing. So that's what you could have done with your money. That's what we're after when we define the I or the discount rate for these problems. So what is this economic analysis? What is the opportunity of con co cost of capital? Is the real rate of return from the next best readily available use of capital, okay? So it's the buying power above inflation. So it's supposed to be accounting for all the inflation. And then how do you actually get that value? There is a federal agency called Federal Office of Management and Budget. And they put out what interest rate to use for different agencies all the time. So for USDOT or for state DOTs, there is a there is federal agency where you, you basically pick that number out and every they, they publish it periodically. And you just go and pick that number out. Okay. But once you know how to do the numbers, the matter of like, you know, picking up an interest rate and doing the analysis is somewhat trivial. And so we don't, as analysts, we never pick I. We never pick the opportunity cost of capital. That's always specified to us from the powers that be, like the federal agency, uh, Federal Office of Management and Budget. Okay. So, so in this class also, you can think of me as your federal office of management and budget. I'm just going to give you the I value, unless you're doing the IRR calculations in which you'll have to figure out what is the internal rate of return. But other than that, I'll just give you the I value. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here now. I think we're, we're bumping into time. It's 7.28 right now. So I'm going to stop here. So in tomorrow's class or tomorrow's lab assignment, I'll wrap up this discussion and then I'll assign some homework problem. I know it's the lab session. So what I'll do is I will, and I'll assign this homework. So, so don't consider this homework problem to be assigned yet. I will have a separate homework icon in your, uh, or homework uh, item in your Canvas page. So don't worry about the homework assignment just yet. I will wrap up this discussion tomorrow. And then once we do that, then I'll assign the lab. Uh, so, so we'll wrap up this lecture because this lecture is somewhat important uh, in when you're thinking about uh, thinking about the lab tomorrow. Okay, so I'll stop here for now, and uh, if you can stop the, I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to stop. Uh, keep keep engaged with the Zoom Zoom session here. I'll be hanging out for a few more minutes. Uh, otherwise, you're free to leave. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.